personally speaking, I would always have voted for independence. And I, I was kind of thinking, well, what, why was that? Um, and I think probably, uh, probably it's got quite a lot to do with being um, a kind of stubbornly independent-minded person. Um, as you might hear from my accent, I was brought up in Belfast. Um, I was actually born in Wolverhampton, but I didn't know anything about that till much later. When we were 11, um, when we were living in Belfast, my parents broke it to us that we were not Irish. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, in the middle of the Troubles, being suddenly English in the middle of it all was sort of a bit of a shock, you know. So in any case, we weren't even really that because my parents, uh, my mother comes from Wick and my dad came from a road junction in Bamshire. <laughs> um, and we spent two weeks, oh yes, every year for 16 years in those two places, Wick being much more frisky than the road junction, I'll tell you. Um, but that was our average travel. You know, when we came across, we came across on the ferry, we'd come up, get lost in Glasgow every year, get spat out in one road or the other. Sometimes we went up the Loch Lomond Road, why were we there? But mostly we were trying to aim for the A9. There was no duelling at all on the A9. Anybody, anybody of a vintage remembers that? Yeah. Yes. So he sat behind the caravan doing 40 all the way, I mean all the way. Um, you get up to Inverness, that was our first stop after Belfast, after getting off the boat. So we'd get off at Inverness, get strawberries in the market in Inverness, get back in the car, go up. And this was before any of the bridges over the firths there. So no bridges either. You go to wiggle in and out and in and out. Second stop on the Struy, which some of you may know, it's the sort of shortcut that Mrs. Tane. When we'd get out and Dad would say, you know, yet again, he'd say, this is the finest view in Scotland. And we'd go, well, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, back in the car. And off we'd go, you know, hurtling north to Wick. And that was our average trip in Scotland, the length of it. And when we crossed the water finally in 1973, I was mystified as to why Scots didn't travel around their own country more. Actually, that has been an enduring puzzle to me, given how beautiful and diverse and amazing this country is. Again, showing my age, those of you might remember in the glory days, well, perhaps, of the uh, Olympics athletics a long time ago, Olga Corbett was a great star, and she scored the first 10 for the uh, gymnastics on the, the floor exercises. And she <coughs> could only score 10 by using every piece of the square. You had to go right tippy toes to the very corner of that place to earn 10. And a part of me has always felt that politicians in this country should do the same. Yeah. That you can't actually, you know, you can't get in unless you score 10 and you can't score 10 until you've been in every single corner of this place to understand it properly, <laughs> physically understand it properly. So that was probably where, where I came, came in and all of this, really being struck by the incredible uh, beauty of Scotland, the diversity of it, and the and the enormous natural resources of it. I mean, if you were off in the northeast, you'd you'd be aware, for certainly about trawling, then about fishing, then obviously about oil and gas. You'd be aware about the coal resources. But when we went up to Wick, even though Wick was always <coughs> renowned and Caithness was always seen as the place that was only interested in nuclear power, all of my folk were able to sort of point in the direction of the Pentland Firth and say, do you know the top six tidal stream sites in Europe? sit in that water. Way back in the 60s and 70s, people knew what the potential was for renewable energy in this country. <laughs> this is the Saudi Arabia of energy, full stop. We have got all that going for us. And you'd kind of think that if you were living in a country that had all that wealth of natural resource and that splendid natural landscape, you'd think that the people living in that country would be healthy, wealthy and wise. <laughs> And we're not really. I mean, on the healthy front, we're not doing at all well, actually. Um, we have, in many of the deprived parts of Scotland, we have practically sub-East European health outcomes. We have areas, particularly of Glasgow, where women are, on average, living to about 52. Uh, we scored recently F for fitness in a European league table. Um, so we're not as healthy as, as we ought to be, given the, the amazing landscape. We're not very outdoorsy either, given what's outside. Wealthy, yes, we've got ex incredible extremes of wealth. We've got Aberdeenshire, which actually has more multimillionaires per head of the population than anywhere else in the UK, including London. And we have extraordinary uh, poverty in Scotland too. I mean, we have that extreme. It's a feature of, of being British. Uh, wise, 
we do a lot of self-damaging things. If you look at the Scottish effect, and this is the real gloomy bit, folks, you know, where everyone who's Scottish is dying fractionally younger than ever their counterparts in the rest of the UK, about two years younger, that's whether you're rich, poor, male, female, that tends to suggest the leading reasons for, 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 for more mortality, early mortality, in Glasgow particularly, but it's, it's true across Scotland, the main causes, they're not lung cancer, they're not heart disease, they're violence, suicide, alcohol abuse and drug abuse. Now that's hopelessness. And that's something, these are elephants in the room, I think, of the independence debate, because all too often we accentuate the positive. Of course there are lots of positives. But I would imagine for, for many of us, the reason that we have moved towards deciding that an independent Scotland has to happen is because we need to create effectively a social democracy in this country. It's actually what we've been voting for. If you look at voting patterns since the formation of the Labour Party in the 1920s, Scots have voted at around 40% for Labour until very recently, but at Westminster elections, solidly through that time with the exception of one national government and three Tory governments in the 1950s. I don't quite know what happened in the 50s, but there you go. Now that is a solid, solid commitment to voting for a, the nearest party in Britain to a social democrat party. And the Scots have a totally different track record in that than the rest of the United Kingdom. It's a very different voting pattern. If you took the 2010 election, for example, just a wee snapshot, um, the proportion of Conservative MPs elected in Scotland was just over 1%. The proportion in Wales of Tory MPs was 20%. The proportion in England of Conservative MPs was 56%. Now that's not wee differences, that's whopping differences. And it's not just been something that happened since 1997, when famously the Scots managed to vote out every single Tory MP, and we should have got a prize for that, because that's <laughs> not easy. <laughs> you know, I mean, never mind a prize for the outcome, but doing that first past the post, when nobody was standing with a clipboard giving everybody instructions, that tells you something actually about the ability to, of Scots to just understand what's needed to be done without actually being given draft instructions to achieve it. But that suggests a bunch of people who actually have a pretty clear idea over time of what they really want this country to be like. They don't want that kind of, of poverty-related health. It's, a sh it's shameful. It hurts us. It wounds any idea we have of ourselves. It's impossible to hold that up beside ideas like even Burns, you know, for a man's a man for all that, or we're all Jack, Jock Thompson's bairns. No, we're not, actually. And we, I think that is one of the main drivers, for me anyway, about the idea of independence in Scotland, because it would be nice to think the world could go, in a, is in a sense, united towards that kind of goals, but actually we've seen for decades the same voting intentions do not exist south of the border in particular, and the tail cannot wag the dog. And for a long time, because I grew up in Northern Ireland, I came across the water here, I then went to university in England, and then I did a journalism course in Cardiff because you had to, you know, get the lot, basically. <laughs> By that stage, you just wanted to get all of your Celtic copybook, the whole lot stamped, you know. Um, and so I've lived and I do like these other parts of the UK, but I am baffled, really baffled at, at the choices made by people in other areas which keep bringing us back towards um, a belief that elites work a belief that an unregulated market economy is good for everyone. It's not. A belief that the House of Lords is modern, please. <laughs> a belief that, you know, the, the, the House of Commons, the whole Westminster setup, can, can be described as the mother of parliaments without something beginning to rise in your throat and actually project itself across the room. <laughs> you know, this is nonsense. It's nonsense. And modern, thriving social democracies, which is where we should be looking towards, we should be looking where we want to go in life, not, not becoming preoccupied with what we want to avoid. There's a wee story about that, and I'll just finish on this because I know we, we have much more fun ahead. Um, <laughs> anybody ski in the room? Come on, it's Edinburgh, it's bound to be skiers. <laughs> um, well... I kind of didn't learn at the right time when I was younger, and then having got two stepdaughters who did want to learn, 
Uh, we went to France. Those of you who've ever learned to know, uh, ski in France know that the system is basically to just be thrown down a hill and get on with it. But most people tend to listen about how to stop before they start hurtling down the hill, and I didn't. So I was hurtling down this hill, didn't know how to do the snow plough, realised I had no means of stopping at all, and saw at the bottom of the hill there was a wee lassie sitting down there playing. And I realised I was heading straight towards her. So I tried a few moves, but I had no moves because I couldn't ski, so I was still <laughs> heading straight towards her. And just before I kind of got to her, I, I cowped to one side, dunted my head, got no sympathy. But then uh, my step, stepdaughter, Rosie, came up and she said, were well, you not listening to the instructor? And I said, well, you know, evidently not. And she said, what he said was, you just need to look where you want to go and your skis will follow. Where were you looking? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if, uh, you know if you've had this experience where you suddenly look at offspring or step offspring or whatever and think, you are in the body of a 12-year-old, but you have the wisdom of a of Methuselah. <laughs> 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 at that point, I thought, you know, that's a life lesson I've just learned here. That's not a small thing. What, whatever you want to avoid, you will go heading straight towards if you keep paying it all your attention. What I had to do then was counterintuitive. I was absorbed by her. I needed to stop looking at her. I needed to find out where I wanted to go. I needed to even look into space. If I'd done that, the skis would have turned. And I think we're in the same position here. I know many of us are very absorbed. How can we not be? Because half our press, half our media, half our families, half of everything, more than half, comes from the south of England. But I don't think you change political systems by simply becoming absorbed with what you don't want to be. I think the change happens, and it happened for me most profoundly, when I, when I spent some time in the Nordic countries and began to realise there were places that were more remote than us, that had had worse times than us, that had been actually occupied during the Second World War, that in Norway's case in 1905, as the second poorest nation in Europe. Um, the Icelanders, for example, barking, barking, barking people. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous barking people. Do you know that Iceland was discovered three times before anyone stayed? <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> But those guys should be dead. I mean, actually, if the volcano goes off as predicted, we could all be in a pickle. But the point is that, you know, these are people living there with absolutely minus nothing. They're living on where two tectonic plates meet. Some of them are living in villages that can only be insured by the government. One day they've got hot springs beneath a conservatory and they can grow cucumbers and bananas in the winter. The next minute the hot springs are beneath their bedroom. They're dead. <laughs> Now, it takes courage to live in a country like that. It takes courage and culture and inspiration and confidence <laughs> and independent-mindedness, such that this is the only place you would ever really want to be. And it's astonishing to see how the Icelanders have managed to put themselves back on their feet because they always expect to be on their feet as a bunch of people. And that's something you can never take away from people, nor can you easily instill it if it's missing. Do the Scots really have that degree of independent mindedness? That's what we need to be going for here. Because once you stop having that idea that jobs come from somewhere else, that value comes from somewhere else, that culture is generally from somewhere else with just a wee wee bitty of your own one just smeared across the sides. When you stop having that attitude to everything and you realise you're standing on your own two feet in life, that what's around you is enough, is more than enough. And that the job for us, in effect, our destiny as a set of people, is simply to try to manage the, the fantastic natural resources we have around us, chief amongst which is us. And realise that the, the only reason that there's ever been a doubt about that, the only reason there's ever been a doubt about the capacity of, of the Scots, which sits like a seed within many, many people and inhibits action and life uh, a lot of the time, is because we have never had a government in this country, ever, I think, which has trusted and empowered us. <coughs> that is what the Nordics have had, or by and large, for the last hundred years. Governments that have actually put them, people first, governments that have been tremendously localised, governments that have taken bold, brave decisions, not applied sticking plaster solutions to things that don't work. So. We have some powers already in this parliament, but we don't have the political will needed to transform Scotland. 
And we need to, because we can. And the moment that I realised that it was important not just to quietly intend to vote yes, but to come out and talk more about it, was, was probably the moment that I came back from Norway, came back here one summer um, and realised just how far behind we were in so many of these health stakes, but how easily we could make changes to get somewhere near the destiny for this country. It's not to become another shadow of a Nordic country, it's to become us. It's to become more fully us, the mongrel nation, which is both the frozen north of Britain and the fertile south of Scandinavia. It, we are north, south, east and west to ourselves. As demonstrated fabulously by that film, we have size and scope beyond our imaginings, actually. And so all credit to the, the National Collective for starting the important business of that imagining, catching the imaginings you've had yourselves as rational, sensible, sentient people in this country and moving that towards the structural change that's needed to release the energy of us all. Thank you. Let's <laughs> go.